All right, guys, I am recording. You want me to catch in? Yeah, count us in. Everybody's having a big fake smile, Steve. Big fake and sincere smiles. Yeah. Right, you guys are back in five. Okay. Four. <laughs> one. Three. Yeah. Two. Uh, one. Yeah. Coming up next on Rugby Wrap Up, Brian Ray, Steve Lewis, and Matt McCarthy with Major League Rugby Talk. Rugby Wrap Up brought to you in part by The Balanced Palette, Nutrition for Peak Performance, and The Pig and Whistle on West 36th Street, the world's best rugby pub. Hey everybody, welcome back to Rugby Wrap Up. Matt McCarthy with Steve Lewis in the Fantasy Sports Network Studio 34 in Midtown Manhattan. And joining us via Skype from Halifax is our Canadian friend, Mr. Brian Ray. Brian, before I welcome Steve, hello. <laughs> hello, Steve. Nice to have you here today so I can do a little gloating to you as well. Steve, welcome. Good to see you. You look tanned and refreshed and you have your voice back from that... Previous sevens tournament? Yeah, you missed your chance. Lost my voice Saturday, and uh, you, you would have had a field day. I wouldn't no, have been able to respond. That is just so not true. It's, that, is, that is not true. Uh, but, uh, Steve, before we get into our MLR talk with Brian Ray, you guys have a little bad blood potentially brewing between the two of you. It's, it's kind of a border war of sorts because your Jamaican sevens team that you are going to be at the helm of is trying to knock off his Canadian sevens team for Olympic qualification. What do you say to that? Well, that part's true. I don't see where the border comes in. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're a long way apart. Roughly. Um, yeah, so looking forward to that. So Canada, obviously, are firm favorites at the uh, RAN regional qualifier for the Olympics. Um, they just came off a good weekend in, in uh, Paris. They, they actually beat England, Ireland, and Wales, but not Scotland, on the last day. Um, so they're going to be firm favorites in that tournament. I'm coaching Jamaica. They've got some talent. They've got some pace. But, um, you know, it's their, it's their it's cool runnings. Rugby style, right? But it's um, it'll be a long shot. All right, so so Ryan, he's got two things over you right now. Mm. Scotland, they didn't beat. He's Scottish. And number two, you had the Jamaican bobsled. That story, <laughs> and, you know, you got the snow. You guys do bobsled. These guys rugby. It's all. I think. I think this is a movie in the making. The Jamaican sevens team under Czar Stephen Lewis knocks off Canada. Just well, saying. it's a sh it's a shame it's not uh, bobsledding going on down there, but unfortunately, it is going to be rugby sevens. Hey, look, if there is going to be a team that's going to upset Canada, it could be Jamaica, but I wouldn't put any money on that. I think their odds just went up a little bit with the uh, the uh, with the arrival of Mr. Lewis, but uh, no, I think uh, hot favorites to get through for this one. All right, you guys are going to put the gloves away for the time being, but we'll bring them back out. But in the meantime, we have Major League Rugby to talk about, and it's just crazy. You know, you, you got the playoffs here after a wild finish, a completely crazy finish. And why don't we go through the games before we talk about the predictions? Let's let's briefly recap. And why don't you start us off, Brian, with Houston? Yeah, you know, uh, Wednesday against Glendale. Uh, Glendale just looked wiped. They had no energy left. And, uh, you know, Houston's got that uh, skip in their step again now with Paul Emmerich running the show. So a great win for them. And then to cap it off, they make a three in one week and four in a row to end the season. They get the win over Utah. Utah actually had a lead in the second half for, uh, I don't know, just a couple minutes. It wasn't long. But the Sabercats never really looked like a team that was going to lose. It seemed like they were confident they were going to get that try in the end. And it was a great one. Matty Truville, his last game, soft little pass to uh, Malachi Esden. He breaks the line, simple two-on-one finish with Osea Kalinasau, and, and that's all she wrote. And then it was a nice touch to give uh, Maddie that little uh, kick at goal at the end. wasn't quite successful, but uh, but hey, at least he gets the recognition uh, on a job well done for him. Yeah, Steve, Matt Truville, they allowed him to try to kick that final penalty goal. And I got, well, I got one thing to say to you, Truville. You had your chance and you blew it. You blew it. <laughs> Stuff, but they did carry him off the field. Good man. Yeah, he is a good man. He is a good man. And I'm not going to say that he's going to be coaching anywhere on the East Coast next year as an assistant coach. Good for servant the, of the game. Major League Rugby teams. I'm not going to put that out there. But all right. Uh, <laughs> you got to tip your cap to Houston. They came on like gangbusters at the end of the season. And, and they all played well. And, I, and we have coaching questions now in front of us, right? You had Glendale let go of Davey Williams after what they thought was a disappointing season. Mayor Mike's not going to. Tolerate a lot, but uh, unfortunately, Davey's been let go. You've had uh, Justin Fitzpatrick of Houston let go, and Paul Emmerich took his place. So I got, a, I got a question for you guys. Does Paul Emmerich get the extension and come back? Me first. Yeah, I'm looking right at you. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> well, no Paul Emmerich is uh, another legend, right? American rugby. He's come in there. Sometimes it's it's just a different voice and different energy. I think it was a word Brian used. Glendale didn't have, but um, so he's come in. He's also had Darren Morris there come across from the Dallas Reds as a forwards coach. So kudos to them. They've turned it around. Sometimes players, you know, I think they were unhappy with the former coaching regime and playing philosophy. So maybe they've been set loose a little bit, and you know, it's end of the season, four games, and it's great for them because it's just brought some life and some zest back yeah. to that to that franchise in Houston, which is an important one, especially with their stadium. Um, moving forward, uh, if I was a director of rugby, would I hire Paul Emmerich? Um, possibly no. Yeah, with four wins, and, and if he has experienced people around him in those areas which he has not experienced. He's a youngish coach, right? Yeah. He's not really coached a lot, bit right. of Air Force. Um, knows his stuff, clearly. But, you know, it, it's, a big, it's a big job now, uh, uh, head coach of an MLR team. So I, I think possibly if you give him the right support round about him. Right, and to Justin Fitzpatrick's uh, side of this, he was wearing two hats. Maybe if there was somebody wearing the director of rugby hat and he was wearing a coach's hat, things might have gone differently. But I kind of agree with you. This is a bigger thing now, and you, you do need separate people. Yeah, he wanted to wear those two hats. I, I, I guess. So would, so would any of us. I'll take them, right? I'll, I'll take those two hats right this second. Two second. different jobs. Yeah. Head coach, general manager. And that, that's something this league hasn't worked out yet. The player personnel decisions cannot be in the hands of head coaches. It works for Belichick. doesn't work for anyone else. Right. All right. Brian, what is your uh, take on Paul Emmer coming back? Yeah, I fully agree. I think he's done a great job as coach. I, I think he would do best uh, leaving him in that role as specifically as a coach along with Darren Morris and then bring in a senior figure as a director of rugby above him just to to handle the rest of that business and, and let him do his own devices for the coaching. And hey, we've seen it work uh, pretty well with these Toronto Arrow guys, with the general manager, Mark Winnegar, head coach, uh, Chris Silverthorne. So uh, I think that's a, uh, the right formula for Houston if they can find an experienced head to help uh, Paul with that transition. Yeah, I, I think Paul should get the nod or get the, sh the shot at coming back. And I noticed that you had to sneak in the arrows there and you got your, <laughs> you changed out your underwear from on the door. And now you got a little TNA on the door there. I, I like that. You got to represent up here in the north. Uh, maybe I'll work on getting some arrows underwear for you next time. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. We, we'll, we can have that conversation in another show. What about the Utah situation? Alf Daniels. Not a good year. Not a good year. You don't um, want to comment on it. He's got the don't ask me these questions on camera look. No. It's a talk show. Hey, I'll comment. Yeah. I think he gets more rope because of uh, the unique situation in Salt Lake City. Which is? Well, I think they were, they were very deliberate in their search for a coach in the sense that they wanted to find someone who could relate to that community or most of the rugby players in that community, i.e. Mormon. Um... He's a good coach, so I think, you know, if that's the way they wanted to go, I think they would probably persevere with it. Um, they played some decent rugby throughout the course of the year, so it's not been all doom and gloom. But, um, yeah, I, th I think he'll get another year, minimum. I think he'll get another year, and I don't disagree that he's, a, he's, he's not a good coach, but I'm going to go some, I'm going on a different angle. I think that management is more responsible for the way the team ended up this year because they lost Paul Lasique and Kurt Morath, and their replacements were basically trying to get the Whitby brothers back healthy. There wasn't a lot coming in in terms of player personnel to replace two of their big players. Their marketing this year was congratulating Paul Lasique for having a contract overseas. That was a marketing thing for the, the Warriors. I think it comes down to wins and losses, but was the coach given enough to win with? You need general managers slash directors of rugby. Brian, Alf Daniels, back or axe? Yeah, you know, if you're looking at results, it's hard to see how he stays with only the two wins. But uh, as Steve, as you say, it's a special situation down there. There's certainly a, a spiritual aspect to that side you have to consider. And, uh, you know, I have some questions about, you know, he didn't seem to use his reserves a lot. He used the, pretty much the same tight five aside from Lieber switching in at hooker for uh, Logan Daniels when he was injured. But not a lot of subs using games. He really uh, he really beat those guys up. Lance Williams played a huge amount of minutes. Matt Jensen played every minute. So I'd have some questions for him on that. But, you know, if, if he doesn't trust his the depth in his side, uh, you know, then maybe that's a question, as you say, for the management rather than, than Alf himself. So, you know, maybe he gets a stay of execution for another year. All right, let's move on. Let's go to San Diego versus NOLA. We're going to skip New York and Toronto and come back to that one as the cliffhanger. But San Diego, NOLA, Steve. Yeah, so every game really had a 
Playoff implications, right? So San Diego, top of the tree, looking for a home advantage. Uh, New Orleans, desperate to win on the outside, needed something out of the game. So San Diego, San Diego went out to an early lead, commanding lead, 19-3, I believe. Um, New Orleans didn't quite ever claw it back, and San, San Diego were in control of the game. New Orleans failed to win, failed to get a bonus point, and that cost them. So they are... Out of the running, fifth place. Yeah, it was a it was a tough end to the season for the Nola Gold, but they they improved incredibly over the course of the season. They played some of the most entertaining and dynamic rugby out there. You know, it was like wide open offense, and it was great. And they tested everybody on defense, and they kind of just ran out of gas at the end. What's your take on that, Ryan? Yeah, you know, uh, most improved team this season for sure. I don't think that's going to be great consolation for the guys in NOLA, knowing how competitive they are. I thought they recruited really well last year, and they just fell at the final hurdle of some some key injuries. I mean, even on the day, they had Kyle Bailey and Scott Gale listed in the original lineup, and they dropped it before kickoff. That's two big blows. And, uh, you know, it just looked like they ran out of steam at the end of the season. Um, so they're going to have to go back and review and figure out why that did take place. But, hey, Nate Osborne's a great coach. I'm here that uh, he's going to stick around for uh, a few more years yet. So that's good for them to have some stability. And uh, hopefully they can keep this core group of guys together and improve on that next season. They were so close. One point. I mean, they got to re regret that loss to Houston in particular. Yeah, uh, no doubt about it. And they were also without their captain, Eric Howard, for a good part of that match. He went out early. So there was a couple of injury uh, problems for them but you know everybody's got these injury problems at this start at this, this point of the year let's go up to seattle hosting austin yeah it's a pretty one-sided game i think we all expected that uh, 38 7 at about 65th minute mark three late tries for austin seattle just went in there cruise control at that point uh, they did austin did get a nice uh, tricky uh, lineup move uh, try early on travis larson just shooting through kind of keeping uh or catching seattle off guard so that's maybe something for uh, for toronto to keep an eye on heading into that semifinal. but overall seattle looked dominant uh, strong side so much depth uh, you know pretty much as expected there and and austin made some noise at the end of the at the end of that match but it certainly wasn't enough to make up for a fizzle of a 16-loss season. And Stephen, they signed Todd Clever to be the director of rugby. Now, if I'm Todd Clever, I'd take that job. But there's got to be a sense of, okay, what the heck am I supposed to do here? Would you take that job? I would take any job <laughs> in rugby, okay? Because, you know, I'd give up. I'd probably still be able to do this if, if it was okay with the management that hired me. But a paying job in rugby as we all know, is something that is very rare. Yeah, I would agree with that. But um, back to the case in hand. So Austin, season-long exercise in futility, right? 0-16. So they basically released Thierry Dopan, who was the, the GM. I think that had to happen. I mean, there was always a very incoherent team-building plan. I, you had too many nationalities, too many different languages, um, heavy Latin American, heavy French and American. So three sort of separate groups like that is very difficult to bring together you can do two so so i think uh, you know richard osborne's very patient owner great guy I, I don't know what their plans are there's all sorts of whispers yeah. about austin going elsewhere columbus todd clever is director of rugby i don't think that's the most effective use of todd clever it's almost unfair and and I hope, I hope you prove us wrong, uh, Todd, but you, I, I think he's up against it, and I think that the, unless so he's being groomed by another GM or another director of rugby... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know what's... The we don't know what, what's the context yeah. behind and what are the plans are, but a yeah. uh, bit of a suicide mission for your first crack at that particular job. But, I, I, again, I would take it. Brian, would you take that job? Of course. <laughs> yeah, I would take that job, but, uh, you know... You go into it with that kind of sense of knowing that uh, it's a tough ask to be sure. But hey, the good news for Austin is there's only one way, and that's up. They can't possibly go any worse. I don't think, uh, unless it's going to be an 18 game season next year. Uh, you know, they just got to do some recruiting. I don't know what Todd Clever is going to be able to accomplish down there. Of course, first he's got to sort out this uh, his head coach thing. Are they going to keep Alan Hiarde? I I doubt that happens after 0 and 16. So he's probably going to have to find a new coach. Going to have to find some new players and. Uh, um, you know, that whole visa thing this year that really set them back was a delay with, with so many cultures, Everything. as you say. It just yeah. takes time. I mean, it was just one thing after another. So, you know, but again, like I said, there's only one way to go from here when you're at the bottom. All right. We got to hustle. Uh, but before we break, 
Richie Walker on the other side, on the other end of the spectrum, you have Seattle, who's defending champion, had a great second half of this season, finished second in points in the league. They're in a great place. They're, they're hosting their playoff game against your Arrows, and they're going to be on their fourth coach in three years, technically, next year as Richie Walker is leaving. And there's different reasons for that, perhaps, but it's going to be their fourth coach in three years. Yeah, so Richie, he's going back to New Zealand. He's coaching the Auckland Storm, which is a women's team in the, in the Auckland program. Um, very, very heavy with senior players, right? So they, they, it was a player-driven team the first year. I mean, they didn't get the coach in time and Phil Mack, player coach, but they, they got some savvy veterans, right, up front and behind, and who basically ran the show. Richie was brought in, um, some, something of a caretaker coach, you know, whatever, two, three into the season, and, um, and he's moving on. So I think, you know, there's another head coach, Sean Seattle, Glendale, Houston, Austin, changes all over the place. Yes, it's the coaching carousel, but we have to take a quick break, and we'll come back with more Major League Rugby after this. Don't go away. I've been blind since I was four, and I've never seen a beer commercial or a beer label. None of that stuff influences me. I drink beer because of the taste. And my beer is Pabst Blue Ribbon. It has a taste and the flavor. What do you think's on the label? I think there's a, a naked woman riding on a unicorn, jumping over fire. Oh, that's good beer. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig and Whistle, on West 36th Street. Hey, this is Matty <laughs> Truville from the Houston Sabercats, and you're watching Rugby Wrap Up. Guys, we're back, but we did not discuss yet Toronto hosting New York, which the three of us had particular interest in. Brian, you got the win, but as a coach... This one, to me, was a game between teams that were trying desperately to give away the win at critical junctures. It was just, here, let me not throw a line out straight. Let me not take the ball to turf. Let me throw it like Jerry Lewis straight up in the air or behind my back. It was crazy. All you had to do was play calm, patient rugby and not commit stupid penalties or throw the ball away. And both teams did that. Did you see that that way, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know who uh, Giuseppe de Toile was passing to, but it certainly wasn't his team picked off by uh, John Quill, of all people, taken in, you know, and, and Quill himself taking a couple dumb penalties in that game. So, yeah, pretty frustrating from both aspects. Uh, less frustrating from a Toronto perspective with Sam Malcolm saving the day at the end with his, uh, of all the players uh, to remain calm, it was Sam kicking that nice little drop goal just at the end, just when we needed it. Uh, yeah, that was, was nerve-wracking. Everybody in the house knew he was going to drop goal that one. I mean, come on. And but, but it should never have gotten to that point. Well, I'd like to think that uh, Toronto could have put in a couple earlier. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think the score is pretty reflective of the two sides, very closely matched. Uh, everybody knew what the two sides were going to do. There was no secret. So uh, I think the fans got, the, got what they wanted. Great showing in Toronto. Uh, entertaining game. You know, uh, New York got in in the end, disappointing loss, but hey, they, they're saved by uh, that one bonus point. So, you know, it, it's all good. We're all headed to the semifinals. So everyone's happy. That's right. That's right. Both teams, we, we picked them. All three of us picked them to do well this year and to be in this position in the playoffs. You picked them to win the whole thing. I picked Rooney to win the whole thing. And I think you picked Toronto to win the whole thing, right, Brian? Yeah, I was certainly leaning in that direction. <laughs> I might have said no at one point, but uh, I'm going to stick with Toronto now. <laughs> we don't want to see Rob Brower kicking that door and dragging you out, kicking and screaming. But New York has to be frustrated, particularly because what they thought they had on paper to start the match didn't materialize. Mark O'Keefe, a scratch right before the game, forcing Chris Matina into the starting lineup. Both teams in the playoffs. Now let's talk about what's ahead of us. We've got Rooney going to San Diego, and your arrows going to Seattle. Which one you want to take first? Let's do San Diego. All right, San Diego. San Diego's got some injuries in that back line. Audsley's been out. Now Mikey Teo off on a cart with maybe an, ingle, an ankle injury. I know USA Rugby's eyes were looking at that one, and he's a key component of that team. Rooney is banged up, but the players that 
would ideally be on the starting pitch for them look like they'll be there in San Diego. So, so you ask me who's going to win? Yeah, who's going to win? San Diego. I can, all, all our friends, all our local friends are not going to be happy. And, uh, I, you know, I don't have a dog in a fight, really. I mean, I've got players on both sides that I'm very, very fond of. But I think San Diego at home, the games have been split, right? The away team won both games. New York won to San Diego, and San Diego returned the favor. I think San Diego just got a bit more form. New York have been effective. They've been pragmatic. They've, got, they've squeaked through. They've got things done. But they've never really played, in my mind, to the full potential. So were they to do that, even game. However, I just feel, I just feel San Diego will have the edge and, and, and win this one. Brian? Yeah, I'm going to lean towards San Diego. I think uh, New York's pretty beaten up. Just on Mike Teal, I'm hearing it's a, a high ankle sprain, probably going to be out for this one, so unfortunate for them. Uh, but I still think San Diego's got the firepower as is. And I think their forward package, nice to get a guy like Joshua Forno in in the last week of the season. Hey, Pretty timely arrival there in the second row. Uh, yeah, I think they're just too strong at this moment at home in front of you know great crowd this past weekend, I think close to 5,000 or something like that. So... I'm going to go with San Diego on this one. Yeah, it was indeed a great crowd, and they had great shots of that crowd. I'm going to go with my heart again. I'm going to go with Rooney. I think, I think they are playing with house money right now. I think they're going to be a little bit loose. I don't think a lot of people are picking them. San Diego is a very strong side, especially at home. Their pack is tough, and Joe Peterson is the class of the league. But I think Rooney is scrappy enough. And united enough, ironically, to win this one on the road. And that takes us, as we run out of time, to our next and final playoff match, the one one of two, Seattle hosting your Arrows. This is a tough one to call. Yeah, it's going to be tough. Uh, I got to lean towards the Arrows. Seven wins in a row is hard to argue. I also think uh, Seattle hasn't really been that tested the past couple weeks. Uh, Austin is pretty much a walk in the park, and they tied against Utah. They haven't looked super sharp. It's going to be tough uh, playing in Seattle in front of that sold-out crowd again, but um I think Toronto has the uh, the momentum and the game plan to get this one done in a squeaker. Steve, if if you're a coach on this team and you've got you've got all your guys healthy now, and you've got to juggle playing time and egos, and you've got some new faces in there, how do you handle this? You know, you got Villy coming back from an injury last year's MVP of the final match in San Diego. Uh, and you've got Samu Munoa. And then you've got the guys that have been playing the flank positions all season long. What, what's your take on that? Oh, that specific situation, I mean, Vili would be on the bench. So it, you, you wouldn't, I wouldn't risk him. I wouldn't start him. You know, he's been out for so long. Um, I'm not quite sure the relative fitness level of, say, Samu Munoa. Obviously, if he's fit, he's motivated, you start him, right? Um, he, he looked like he's been getting the swing of it a little bit uh, these last couple of weeks. So I'd probably tell him to go out there and burn, and, you know, go to Lee Burns and, you know, and bring, out, bring out the undertaker. What position would you put Sam away? Depends if everyone else is fit. I mean, he, he will just tear things up on the back row. But, you know, they've, 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 got, they've got choices. It's not like uh, they've had other guys who perform well, right, over the course of the year. So uh, relative fitness and possibly the type of game you're trying to play might affect that. But Vili, I would have on the bench. I would be leading him in a little bit later in the game. Who's going to win that one? Who's going to win? Um, I, I'm picking Toronto. I picked them right here at the beginning of the year. That was a dumb you question. Remember. That's a dumb um, question. So I'm asked. sticking with Toronto. I, I thought the schedule would work out in a favor. And Brian really hit the nail on the head. Momentum. Momentum. They're, they're on form. They're on a roll. Uh, confidence is a, is a fragile thing. It, it builds, and you can be unstoppable. And on the other end of the table, you can, you know, when, when you start getting twitchy, you start getting twitchy. All right, this is week number 95 of our show, and I just asked dumb question number 4,271 of you. I'm going to ask question 4,972 of you next, my friend. Who's going to win, Toronto or Seattle? Toronto. Toronto by, uh, Toronto by three. How about that one? All right, I, I guess I'm in the minority again. I'm going with Seattle. I'm going with Seattle at home, at Starfire. 
They're on fire. I think Samu is going to make a big impact. I think Villy's going to make a decent impact. And I think that that clubhouse is mature enough to put egos aside and to say, let's get the most out of everybody that we got in here and get another championship. Because, they, again, they're kind of rallying around another coach leaving. So it puts a lot of onus on them. And they have reacted well to this in the past. So I got Seattle versus Rooney in my final. Not San gonna... Diego versus Toronto. And you've got San Diego versus Toronto, right? Precisely. All right, and on that note, my friends, we are out of time. So I want to thank Mr. Brian Ray of America's Rugby News calling in from Halifax <laughs> with a little TNA, and Mr. Stephen Lewis, the Jamaican legend, czar, who's going to take them to the promised land by beating Canada in sevens. I'm Matt McCarthy for both of these men from the Rugby Wrap-Up Studios, Studio 34 in New York City, signing off.